Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy's uh, Summer Innovation Showcase. Uh, my name is Matt Cannon, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you to this event on behalf of the entire uh, Tomcat Center team. Um, we're also very fortunate to be joined by the uh, founders of three really interesting uh, new ventures today. Uh, the, the ventures are called uh, Mizu Risk Labs, In Situ Energy, and Phoenix Materials. Um, and they're tackling challenges um, spanning uh, water uh, analysis and water risk management in agriculture, um, the energy transition for fossil fuel asset owners, um, and the, the supply chain for uh, concrete production, one of the, the biggest products uh, produced today. Um, so uh, we'll, obviously we'll hear about more about them uh, in just a minute. Uh, for those of you who have been here before, you, you kind of know the, the format, but for those who are joining us uh, to one of these events for the first time, uh, we're going to hear short presentations uh, from each of the founders, so about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, uh, for them to answer questions afterwards. So if you could please um, use the, the Q&A function to enter your questions um, during the, the presentation by each of the, the founders, um, I will do my best to accommodate those questions uh, in, the, in the short Q&A session after their presentation. Um, they will also have a chance to uh, to respond uh, in, in writing to anything that we don't get a chance to to discuss um, in the in the Q and A session. Um, so we we really have uh, two main objectives. Uh, first and foremost, it's for you to get to know these uh, innovations and these uh, innovators. Um, and if you have an interest in learning more or connecting with them, uh, perhaps for uh, partnership or in investment or uh, or just to to learn more about what they're doing, um, this is a, a great opportunity for you to uh, to reach them. Um, so please feel free to to reach out to them directly um, or um, to uh, to coordinate with uh, with us at the Tomcat Center and we can help uh, facilitate those conversations subsequently. Um, the other purpose is for you to just get, uh, to to get to know the Tomcat Center a little bit better. So you're going to see basically three, Teams is really just a sampling of um, the, the large number of innovations now that we've supported here at the center through the uh, Tomcat Innovation Transfer Program. Um, the, to date, there's 119 teams that we've supported, um, most of which have gone on to create uh, new companies tackling challenges in sustainability and energy. Um, and uh, many of those are are thriving um, and at, at various stages. So you can find out uh, a, a lot more about the program and um, all the teams that we've supported uh, over the past, uh, it's been about 11 years now, uh, through our website. Um, and I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, th that link is in, is in the chat. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that also in the chat is the uh, LinkedIn Tomcat networking group. That's another great way to connect um, with the folks you'll hear from today, as well as uh, other members of the of the community that uh, that we've supported through Tomcat programs. Um, so, without further ado, uh, we'll start with our uh, first um, uh, innovator. Uh, this is uh, Tomo Kumahira, uh, who is the the founder of Mizu Risk Lab. Tomo is from uh, the, the GSB and the Door School of Sustainability here at Stanford. Um, and Mizu Risk Labs is really developing a, an AI-enabled uh, analytics tool for assessing risk in with respect to water management um, in agriculture. And uh, Tomo, thanks so much for, for joining us, and we're excited to hear about Mizu. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for joining the session. I'm going to share our screen right now. Hope we can see the screen now. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Cool. Perfect. Yep. Um, really nice to talk to you all today and looking forward to any questions that are come up. Uh, as I was introduced to, uh, my name is Tomo and we work on water risk analytics for volatile climate future. What we do in one sentence is 
to predict water availability to help food and agriculture businesses reduce climate risks. And I'd like to start with explaining the connection between water and food and climate. And to give a easiest example, I'd like to start with what we all are familiar with, a burger. Did you know that in order for us to create one burger, uh, it takes almost two tons of water, which is about two months of shower that we take uh, for every day. So a lot of water is actually hidden within anything that we eat every single day. And the way it works is like this. In order for us to have one quarter pounder of meat, we take a lot of grains to grow the cows. And in parallel with growing the grains themselves, you need to feed the cows with water. And all in all, you have generally 10,000 more times of volume of water that is required to produce one unit of beef. So this way you can now see a lot of water is hidden within what we eat every single day. And that's why we believe water in agriculture, it's such a critical element of climate change action, in particular when it comes to adaptation. So the problem here, the reason why we are working on this water issue in agriculture is because we believe water is a known risk management nightmare. To start with, it's 70% of freshwater use consumed in agricultural sector alone. So it's much more than what we consume from our residential use or industrial use even. And it's fed 80% by rain. So now you can see what climate change would do to us. Because if, if the water distribution shifts as a result of climate change, we're exposed to significant change. And finally, it is not just climate problem. It is a business problem as even in US alone, there's $5 trillion of agricultural assets relying on this very concentrated high volume of risk uh, through water. So this is why we want to solve this from technology and also business at the same time. So the complication, why is such a hard problem to be solved? We see it's a layers of difficult, difficult uh, simulations. On one end, you have rainfalls, precipitation, you have surface water, and finally groundwater. All of them are known to be a difficult challenge to model in general, and not to mention combining all of them together is another level of challenge. And that's why people have been quite challenged to see the future of water availability, despite the fact that they suffer from floods and droughts every now and then. And when it comes to offering analytics to stakeholders such as farmers, agribusinesses, and financiers, the system is quite broken in three different ways. First, data is not really gathered in a way that is addressable or analyzable. Expertise are also siloed. So climate scientists cover climate, not necessarily water or agriculture or finance. And on the ground, stakeholders to make decisions, you need to have all of them together, which is really hard to get. Finally, as a result of these siloed data and expertise, people on the ground really struggle to access relevant metrics or decision tools so that they can see what's the future like and make calculated risk taking as a result of it. And that's why uh, myself and my co-founder, Rio, are excited to solve this problem. I myself uh, spent five years in rural Kenya working on forestry and planting 40% of Kenya's tree planting with 30,000 farmers. My The other co-founder, Rio, was trading 20% of Japan's corn. And we both felt and experienced the need to address water challenges in agriculture because our job has been disrupted many, many times by this. So we are solving the problem that we wish we could have solved before. And that's why we know it's an important problem. And at Stanford, we even developed the world first solution map on what are the solutions existing on the world about water uh, in agriculture. So if you're interested, you can search for Mizu, you can download the report. But besides that point, we built a team of incredible scientists and research uh, experts and engineers who supported our early development of the concept. Uh, this includes Professor Gretchen Daly, uh, who is our PI for the Tomcat grant, as well as Professor Buzz Thompson at Stanford Law School. And we are grateful for Tomcat and other uh, Stanford ecosystem support on entrepreneurship. And what we are building really is 
the answer is so what of water stress. So if you can know how much water in a given particular location, you will be able to assess what would be the trend that you're on, what would be the stress scenario in the worst case climate change scenarios, and you can plan accordingly what to plant, especially if you are planting almonds or more expensive long-term crops, you need to have the landscape planning now instead of later. And you can also appraise what are the values in the land given the climate risk. And if you own many, many of these farms, you can also risk assess them at the portfolio aggregated level. So these are the questions that we got on the ground uh, interviewing all, almost over 250 stakeholders. Um, and Tomcat Grant has been quite useful and helpful in accessing these insights. And this is not just helping one farmer or one area in California. It relates to a larger business opportunity through scaling our solutions. So right now what we are focused on is water risk evaluation. But at the same time, what we means is that climate change will probably process through water stress uh, in many of the businesses that use so much of water, such as agriculture. And that is a significant opportunity, even from analytics perspective. And if you know analytics, you would have a lot of opportunities to understand and underwrite risks that other traditional investors or banks cannot underwrite. So we see in a greater future, if you can see the future, we will be able to underwrite the risks others can. And just to give you a sense, Agricultural lending in the U.S. alone is quarter trillion dollar asset class, um, and the need to have a more lenient, new way, a climate adapt way of financing is getting more and more. So we hope to be significant catalysts in this ecosystem, and hopefully be the one financing the transition for farmers and agriculture communities. And thus far, we have been helped by Tomcat and others to really turn the in innovation and research into real product. And we focus a lot on research building and market research, and then co-design pilots since spring of this year. And now this summer, we are actually building a minimum viable product uh, with actual co-design partners, and we are having initial sales uh, as of now. So just to summarize, we are moving fast to build and test and iterate. Um, we interviewed uh, over 250 stakeholders, acquired four co-design partners, some of them are paying, uh, developed minimum viable product for demo, and now we see a growing wait list uh, for the new product launch and moving to paid pilots with real data. So we're all excited about and great, grateful for the support um, and uh, future to come. Um, so if you're interested in water, agriculture, climate, if you experience these stress firsthand, love to learn what you your journey has been and love to explore ways we can help. If you know anyone who deeply is worried about water, we'll love to know. If you're interested in investing, we're not raising funds right now, but we are building a list uh, of investors who are interested. Um, so please let us know. And the contact uh, for myself and the report is there. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn to stay connected. Thank you very much for the time. And I will uh, move on to the Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Tomo. Um, before we jump into to questions, uh, I, I just want to say that uh, Tomo was kind enough to share the report with me after a, I, I think we connected at a at Tomcat Social in the past, and so I, I had a chance to sort of take a sneak peek uh, earlier, and it's it's truly a a comprehensive and 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 really fantastically readable um, uh, overview of of this problem and the potential solutions. So I would uh, strongly encourage. Uh, anyone who's uh, remotely interested in water or anything adjacent to to this problem to to check that out. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I guess I would say that th this is a, a problem that that certainly doesn't get anywhere near the the attention that that it deserves. So so thanks for for sharing with us a little bit about what Mizu is doing. Um, I I wanted to to start with um, uh, maybe you could tell us a, a little bit more about the the technology and what kind of data is sort of most critical for you to obtain and then um, you know how you process that to to sort of deliver actionable um, information to the end user absolutely um so to answer the question about technology and data and 
actionability. Um, so technology itself, what we are building in the minimum available uh, product phase is a machine learning model that uh, help users select climate scenarios, uh, your current land use, uh, and other assumptions about water availability. Some areas you have uh, higher policy intervention and less policy interventions. So we, we incorporate these nuances as toggles, and you will be able to simulate uh, what would be the water availability. So in most of agriculture region, you use acre foot per acre, which is a particular uh, number that a lot of uh, farmers or on the ground uh, professionals use. Um, by combining uh, precipitation prediction, um, groundwater prediction, and surface water predictions. And machine learning has been a central component of this because it helps us um, simplify a number of analysis that would have taken otherwise many weeks of engineering professionals working on their laptops. Um, so we are benefiting from uh, these novel technologies allowing us to simplify calculations so that people can do uh, simulations many, many times uh, with much lower cost faster. Um, and when it comes to data availability, right now we are working uh, with uh, three sources. Uh, first uh, is publicly available data. Climate uh, data has been quite accessible in many fronts. Um, so we are taking full advantage of that to start with. And secondly, we gather information uh, that are needed uh, for particular uh, water availability in particular geographies by interviewing some of the stakeholders or going and visit and asking for the data uh, outputs um, uh, in person. And finally, uh, we ask for inputs from the users who have been the first-hand experience uh, of water stress or water abundance. Uh, and these information are combined uh, in the model so that we can have more localized, specific uh, simulations that not only takes into the big picture at the ecosystem level, but also takes into account the assumptions made by the specific stakeholders um, so that people can see a range of scenarios uh, in the analysis and uh, understand what can be done. Great. And, and can you say more about the the you mentioned some co-design partners for the for the pilot. Can you can you share more about who those co-design partners are or, or what types of entities are? Your yes, partners? absolutely. Um, uh, one of them is financial institutions uh, who is uh, interested in safeguarding their uh, customers as well as loan portfolios. Um, so they they loan a lot of money to agriculture and they want to see the long term sustainability. Uh, we have uh, appraisers and consultants who have been currently relying on five-year average as a way to predict the future. And they have seen so many troubles and they really wanted to uh, work with us on that. Uh, we have another one, uh, which is uh, one of America's largest um, growers association. So uh, farming communities, members who want to, again, understand the water stress more at the community level so that they can take more actions. And we have uh, one grain trading firm. Um, that has been uh, quite interested in how the U.S. agriculture will shift over time. Right, and so so the the information that that people are currently using to make these um, uh, analyses is really just the five year averages, or, or or what else? What sort of the state of the art today for? Yeah, the... so so interestingly, there are two kinds of uh, available alternatives, so to say. So the first alternative is to look at state website or USDA websites. They have a lot of uh, analysis done, but it's not necessarily uh, fit into your specific form that you want to look at. Um, in order for you to look at the specific forms, you need to consult either lawyers or consultants and appraisers um, whose service costs money, a lot of money. Uh, in addition, um, they typically rely on historical numbers and just try to extend that from that. Um, so five-year average is one of the most commonly used way. Um, and if you, for example, take R square, um, it's it's pretty it's pretty bad. It's, it, oftentimes we see uh, negatives. Well, if you use machine learnings and other tools, you would see uh, more than eighty percent uh, in R square. So you will see a uh, dramatic difference uh, in the analysis that you will see. Okay, and um, just in terms of, of you know thinking about the users and the and the customers, I can see you know from the point view of a someone making loans or the portfolio managers um you, you know at, that it's straightforward to get traction with those parties if you think about the farmers um uh you know the the people who are making decisions sort of on the ground how do you think about you know demonstrating the value to them 
uh, enough to get them to, I, I'm not sure what your business model is with some sort of subscription service or, yeah. or, you know, individual uh, payments. How, how do you, are you going to sort of start with the portfolio managers as the first customers and then work your way to the farmers or try to engage both from the outset? Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we learned over the past probably eight weeks of trials and errors on the ground with many, many stakeholders and iterations is that everyone is looking to understand uh, one simple thing, how much water they would have access to in a given particular land. And some stakeholders wanted to do that for 100 farms at, at once. Others want to do it for their own. But fundamentally, what they're looking at is water availability and the level of stress they should expect. Um, so what we are uh, trying to do right now as an early stage startup is to converge them into one single place where you would have um, you have satisfied uh, both of their needs um, because it's it's discussed in many different ways, but at the end of the day, people just want to know whether they have enough water for what they are been doing uh, yeah. in, in timeline. And that's that's the sim exact same question that any different stakeholder would ask. Yeah. And then, uh, the, so the last question we have time for today. So, uh, if, if you know, I can see how you, you're giving information to make decisions about whether or not to make a loan, or, or you know, sort of the value of a of a given farmland, um, you know, with respect to the water availability. Do do you envision making recommendations about sort of adaptations that farmers can make, or or changes to water management practices that can be made to um, mitigate these risks, or how much um, how much optionality is there in terms of what a farmer can do to manage their their water? Absolutely. I think that's where we are looking forward to in the future. Um, if you they you know how much gap is to be filled, and it's we're in a very naturally good place to suggest how to fill that gap. Um, and right now, we what we are serving for is the need of uh, users to really understand how many acres or how many percent of farms to be followed or not, not used um, so that they can sustain water um, uh, sustainability level. Um, and the next extension is about more nuanced. And luckily, we have done the research on, on cataloging all the possible solutions. So uh, we hopefully uh, can connect the dots back again to our original research. Great. Well, uh, thanks again for, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, roll out your, your first product and uh, seeing uh, Mizu continue to grow. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. Okay, so our, our next uh, uh, venture is called In-Situ Energy and we're joined by Sankal Banerjee, uh, the, the co-founder uh, of In-Situ. Um, In-Situ Energy is really addressing uh, this challenge of what to do with um, fossil fuel assets that are that are being retired, and there's certainly plans for uh, retiring uh, an increasing number of these in in the years to come as as we navigate the energy transition. Uh, so, some couple are excited to hear about uh, In Situ's approach to this challenge. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Matt. I'm just going to share my screen. Is this uh, visible to everybody? Yeah, it's great. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, well, thanks again, Matt. Uh, thank you all for joining. We're in situ energy. Uh, our team has experience in uh, grid modeling, remote sensing, and project finance. And we're bringing all that together uh, to really build software to accelerate clean energy deployment on uh, brownfield infrastructure. So as many on the call will know, uh, the US electricity grid is really going through a once in a century moment of significant strain. There's three factors that really make today particularly unique. Uh, there's excessive load growth for the first time in decades. This is driven not just by AI data centers that we're all reading about, but also electrification more broadly and the onshoring of manufacturing to domestic sources, which has tripled since before the pandemic, all of which needs extensive amounts of electricity. At the same time, there's, a, there's an imperative to decarbonize, uh, driven both by regulation and the improving economics of clean energy. And at the same time as that, it's getting harder and harder to actually build new stuff in new places. So it's harder to find permanent land. It's uh, hard to 
find interconnection opportunities with queues longer than six years in many parts of the country. Uh, and it's very often that you run into community opposition when building on greenfield sites, in particular, uh, converting farmland to uh, sources of clean energy. So it's simply impossible uh, from our perspective to meet this unique uh, moment in this uh, in our grid's history by simply building on new land or on new sites. Uh, so we really have to be really good at making use of what we already have. That's land that's already been used and permitted for industrial applications, um, as well as the, the billions of dollars of existing infrastructure that we've already spent and built. The good news is that there is a lot of uh, what we call brownfield infrastructure. What we mean by brownfield is anything from uh, mine lens, landfills, retiring power plants, as Matt, Matt mentioned, as well as industrial and uh, broader EPA brownfield sites, which really we see as becoming front and center for the rest of the energy transition. If you just look at the sites which have been earmarked by the EPA as brownfields and as ones which have significant clean energy potential, that amounts to nearly a thousand gigawatts of clean energy capacity. If we conservatively calculate only a small portion of that would be economically feasible under current market conditions and look at just the development revenue. So not the total CapEx, just the development revenue associated with that. That's north of a hundred billion dollars just on these brownfield sites. There's a number of factors which is creating what we're calling a perfect storm for brownfield conversions in particular. And uh, and we're seeing kind of tailwind from four, four different directions. First is for the assets themselves. There are a significant number of redundant stranded assets. This includes retiring coal power plants, but also mine lands, which have already been abandoned, for which the asset owners are looking for uh, ways to get value from. At the same time, there's hungry site developers on the clean energy side, as well as on the data center side, who are facing these land scarcity and long interconnection queues, which is motivating them to look at brownfield development. On the community side, these are brownfield sites which have, have a history of already being polluted. Uh, so there is a social license to operate uh, in a way that does not uh, disrupt community support that is traditionally faced for greenfield infrastructure or uh, using uh, farmland to support clean energy. And on the government side, this is one of the few things that has actual bipartisan government support. Uh, so everyone from the Biden-Harris administration, the DOE, which has allocated $250 billion exclusively for development on coal communities and energy communities, all the way to local governments, state governments, uh, EPA jurisdictions across the political spectrum uh, have a kind of support for, for building on these sites. Of course, repurposing old sites for new energy applications is not a new concept. It's certainly been done before. There are examples from converting coal power plants to solar and storage, um, giving mine lens new life in the form of solar projects, building solar and wind projects on land landfills, uh, similarly using industrial sites for data centers. So certainly not a new concept, uh, but the clear issue is that these happen in, in too few a number and too far in between. And when they do happen, they happen in a completely ad hoc manner. Uh, so what we're sitting at right now is very clearly an inflection point where there's tremendous demand, this perfect storm, but at the same time, not a very scalable way of tackling this uh, opportunity to convert uh, brownfield sites. So it's moving from uh, this opportunity, which is uh, in the domain of kind of niche opportunistic energy developers to something that very clearly will need to become mainstream and something that every single energy developer will need to have a strategy around. Um, so our team took a first principles approach to really understand why there aren't more of these brownfield conversions happening all across the country. We spoke to a wide variety of stakeholders, everyone from uh, energy developers to environmental remediation specialists, local governments, communities, uh, state economic development associations to really understand what's blocking more of these conversions from happening. And we heard three things over and over again. First, that the discovery of these sites is very, very difficult. This is true even for brownfield specialists who have been doing only this for the last 15 years, do not actually have confidence in the full suite of uh, what the total number of potential brownfield sites are and where to find them at scale. The second is environmental liabilities is widely still considered to be the big unknown unknown with respect to tackling and understanding this opportunity set. And the third is with respect to connecting these projects to the grid. 
And of course, interconnection is an issue more broadly applicable to any type of clean energy development, but is especially pronounced, uh, pronounced for specific um, brownfield applications. And so we're building from the ground up to tackle exactly these three barriers, as we have uh, discovered by speaking to a number of stakeholders. And we're focused on two main uh, sources of value. First is helping developers find these high likelihood brownfield sites that are particularly suited for clean energy conversions. And the second, once you have found these sites to actually de-risk the development process with respect to environmental liabilities, managing interconnection issues, as well as securing offtake um, with some of these unique challenges and attributes. We've also found through our process that there's no shortage of software in the clean energy domain. In fact, uh, many of the developers we speak to feel like they're overserved uh, with software. The clear issue though, is that a number of these software tools are built with a green, a greenfield prospecting in mind and don't address the unique challenges associated with building on brownfield sites. So what we're doing precisely is three things. One, we're building a curated site universe of these sites. We uh, do that through a combination of structured and unstructured data from a wide variety of sources. Some are directly from regulatory bodies, others are from uh, hidden places within the government, others are from private sources. And then we supplement that with uh, sites which are not present in any databases anywhere, public or private. We just came back from uh, Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia and saw a whole host of sites that uh, we know are not under the purview of uh, the EPA databases currently. The second thing we do is we help quantify these environmental liabilities, which are serving as the, as the unknown unknowns. We use remote sense data on everything from land topology to looking at soil characteristics to identify contamination hotspots. And then based on that information, build purpose-built models to actually automate the building of a lot of these remediation plans. Uh, that information can be used to either secure a comfort letter from an EPA uh, from an EPA design, designee or to secure a favorable quote from an insurance perspective. The last component is the electrical infrastructure um, where we use no-code network simulations to help identify brownfield specific issues from an interconnection repurposing perspective. Um, we use information on existing capacity, what is called surplus interconnection at uh, favorable substations, as well as information on uh, using census data to identify what the load, uh, approximate loads around these substations are likely to be, and then use that to cre uh, create a kind of tailored recommendations that will help fast track, uh, fast track not just the interconnection process, but also the broader permitting process for developers. To provide a quick snapshot and a double click on some of these unknown unknowns that we're helping, uh, helping bring to the surface, on the environmental liability side, of course, there's a whole host of different data sources that become relevant. Some, as I mentioned, uh, directly from government databases, others which need to be significantly cleaned, uh, collated, and cross-referenced with uh, state-level databases, as well as from sites which are currently uh, not under the purview of any of these databases. Um, and we take that information to create these remediation plans, which factor in not just uh, your, your basic remediation activity, but also some of the higher level work around slurry disposal, some of these sites which might need to be revegetated to make it suitable for building solar in the first place, ongoing activity with respect to groundwater monitoring to ultimately create the package uh, of information that'll make it much, much easier uh, to secure quotes from an insurance provider or to secure the comfort of, uh, of the EPA. Then we look at site-specific characteristics that actually bring these projects uh, much closer to being underwritable. Um, that includes a couple of different categories. First, on the interconnection side, not only identifying the most likely points of interconnection, but looking at the various ways that we can repurpose existing sources of interconnection. So in the context of a retiring coal power plant, there might already be a substation with uh, available headroom that is not being used, that has surplus interconnection. In other cases where there is not available, uh, available substation capacity, there might be an opportunity to uh, co-locate um, co these interconnection sites near load set centers, which is where mine lens and landfills already are located. And then we have other information around soil density and the proximity towards other landforms within these sites that help uh, make the underwriting process for brownfield developers even simpler. 
And then we really take that all the way to the project economics in a way that is responsive to these site characteristics. So that includes not just the specific generation profile and the offtake considerations, as, uh, but also ways in which we might be able to incorporate incentives both at the federal, local, and state level um, to, 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 to create the best possible case for repurposing these sites. So a quick snapshot of where we are today. Uh, we have a, a prototype that has received uh, very positive traction and val validated across the spectrum from developers, remediation specialists, to economic development agencies. We're going beyond that to actually integrate uh, sites on the ground with communities uh, throughout Appalachia who are interested in using our platform to actually attract developers, uh, which gives us unique insights into sites that are otherwise not available in the public domain. Um, we're initiating software pilot pilots with both categories of customers. So with counties looking to attract developers as well as energy and data center developers who are searching uh, for these sites to build at scale. The next step is to execute um, three additional pilots and convert the learnings from these pilots into a site recommendation engine, which can be deployed at scale. Um, I can pause there and uh, invite any questions. Great, thank you, Sankar. Um, I, I had no idea that, that all of these sites weren't even already know <laughs> that sounds like you just got back from a field trip to to scope out some additional sites in in Kentucky. So yeah, maybe that leads into my first question. So around data collection, um, how much do you have to physically go out to uh, a site, um, and in particular with respect to the environmental remediation considerations? Um, do you you alluded to sort of this remote sensed data? Are there cases where you have to augment that, if I'm understanding what that term means, where you have to augment that with additional sort of physical sample collection and analysis of soil or or whatnot? Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, the the current process is that there are a sort of a, a team and a slew of environmental consultants who do exactly what you just described, which is once you have a site or a prospect of interest, you would deploy this team on the field to collect these soil samples, which they then take to the lab. Um, the problem is that that is a fairly scarce resource that needs to be very judicious, uh, judiciously applied. And so you can't do that for the full universe of 400,000 sites um, that the EPA has identified as a starting point. And so our um, our, our main value proposition, which we're he hearing from uh, folks that we speak with, is that our tool can be used uh, to hone in on the areas which are the most likely to be conducive for clean energy development. So um, we can use data around what the slope of the land, uh, you know, acidity of the soil, all of which is available uh, kind of before you send a team um, out onto the field to collect these soil samples. Um, and we can down select the sites which are much more likely to be conducive to development in the first place so that those resources can be deployed in a much more strategic manner. Um, and then the second piece of that is that as we kind of go out to build the, to expand the universe of sites beyond the hundreds of thousands that already are known to exist, um, that there is actually a significant amount of information in uh, county courthouses. Uh, which are then aggregated to regional economic development associations. So our way of scaling the data collection effort is to partner with the right level of aggregation. And uh, there's some degree of, uh, you know, going to these sites, which are inevitable and you just, just need to do to improve the quality of your models. But there's a whole host of other techniques at the right level of aggregation, which can, which can scale much faster than is being done currently. I see. And you alluded to this a little bit, but you see sort of your first customers as being um, local governments or counties that would get access to your database and then and then use that to to attract developers. Or are you envisioning sort of going straight to developers and saying offering a subscription or something to access access your tool? Yeah, so so we're we're doing both, and so our universe of uh, of pilots is to is is really two pronged. So there are developers who are uh, kind of interested in using what we already have as they continue to expand their universe of sites uh, to help them down select where to focus. Um, who you know simply cannot find enough of these sites quickly enough. Um, at the same time, by partnering with kind of local counties, regional economic development associations. Um, we can provide value to them because they're interested in attracting developers to sites and they would like to 
look at their own sites from the perspective of a developer so that they understand what is valuable, what is less valuable. Um, and so what that does is that it, both of those kind of categories of pilots uh, improves the experience for, uh, for, for the other. Um, with working with local counties, we add value to them and also improve the quality of the underlying database for the site universe. Okay. And then just circling back to this, the, the thousand gigawatt number that you that you mentioned at the, yeah. the beginning, that corresponds to to putting PV on the land area of all these brownfield sites, or or yeah. can, can you walk us through where that number comes from again? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of sources. So EPA did a study where they identified these two hundred fifty thousand uh, brownfield sites, specifically for ones which have um, kind of sufficient solar resource and uh, sufficient wind speeds. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that includes a few categories, mine lands, uh, landfills, as well as what the EPA designates as other other brownfields, which could be like abandoned industrial sites. So okay. if you aggregate the land area uh, layer on top of that, uh, the land which is actually buildable and the land which is actually gets enough sun or enough wind, yeah. uh, that's where that, that number comes from. I see. And then, um, so I, I can understand how some of you know substations and and some of those assets are sort of directly usable. But the the big you know in a coal plant, for example, the boiler, the, I mean the the massive footprint of the actual power generator itself, um, it's harder for me to see if that would be usable or it's something that just has to be torn down or just or just built around. Uh, how do you deal with those assets that are truly linked to the fossil resource? Um, uh, yeah, so. yeah, for sure. So for retiring power plants in general, the the way we look at it is typically taking like a thirty mile radius around the plant, right? So there's the land around the plant which would be suitable for repurposing that interconnection, and that's kind of your total buildable area for the clean energy that it replaces. For the infrastructure on the site itself, there's a, a couple of different uses. So in some cases, if you are shutting down the coal plant, but you still want to uh, use it as a synchronous condes condenser, so not providing energy to the grid, but just providing uh, what's called reactive power to the grid, so spinning the turbine for frequency regulation, then a good chunk of that infrastructure can still be used. Uh, when we talk to environmental remediation specialists, they say that the number one thing in terms of source of value, which is always underestimated, is uh, simply the value of scrap metal uh, and all the other kind of components of, of the site, which would need to be, maybe does not have a direct application for clean energy, but still has some market value that the asset owner can salvage. Fascinating. Um, thank you. So we, we, unfortunately, we've run out of time in the in the Q&A session. There's a, there's a handful of questions um, in the Q&A function. Um, so, so please uh, uh, answer those if you get a chance. And uh, thank you again for joining us and telling us about uh, in situ. Great. Thanks very much. Great. And uh, so now we'll move on to our, our uh, final venture, uh, Phoenix Materials. Um, this is founded by uh, Krish Mehta and Jorge uh, Ocio Norgard. Um, Phoenix is really uh, trying to decarbonize concrete by uh, leveraging a, a another massive uh, industrial uh, waste stream that sits unutilized today. So Krish, uh, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Thanks all for having us. I'm excited to share the vision for Phoenix Materials. So Phoenix Materials decarbonizes concrete by refining landfill coal ash. Now, Suncorp already set the stage for one of the macro drivers behind our vision, which is to drill deeper. Coal power plants are shutting down across the country. This is a multi-decade long trend that's been going on and, and will continue to happen purely because of economics at this point. And while good for the environment, it does mean that the amount of coal ash generated has fallen and will continue to fall. Ash supply today is about 30% that of historic levels. Fast forward to 2040, it drops to 5%. Why that matters? Ash plus cement together act as the glue to bind sand and gravel to make concrete. So concrete is the end product that's all around us, while ash can replace up to 30% of cement to create a concrete that's both cheaper and higher quality, which is why most of the concrete in the world already has ash in it today. What's happening now as ash supply falls is there's been a shortage. So if you look at the historical trend lines for supply versus demand of coal ash, 
you see that they're fairly uncorrelated. However, in the last few years, you'll notice this drop in demand, which is now remarkably correlated to this drop in supply. And we've seen that play out in the markets where the price of ash has increased up to 3x in certain regions in the United States. Fast forward to 2040, this translates to a 30 million ton shortage in material, which equates to a $6 billion opportunity in the US alone that we're going after. The key here is without ash, customers are using more cement. More cement means higher cost, means lower quality, and means increased emissions. It's a lose-lose-lose situation, which is why customers are doing all they can to get their hands on a reliable source of ash, including running over their grandmother for ash. We found the perfect solution. Landfills around the country contain up to 2.5 billion tons of coal ash. For our purposes, it's effectively infinite. 2.5 billion tons equates to 100 years worth of demand, which equals $200 billion reserve. Uh, one of the things that we realized when digging deeper into this space is coal ash is actually the second largest waste produced by mankind. So as we think about uh, just the size of these landfills, if you consider plastic waste as an analogy, uh, plastic waste is about one fourth the size of coal ash waste. So this is really just almost an order of magnitude larger than most other waste streams that we typically discuss. These sites are cheaper in that they're liabilities for utilities. So utilities actually pay penalties for having these sites. And so taking ash away means that we get dipping fees. So our raw material costs are effectively negative. And critically, uh, these sites are closer. So in an industry where logistics costs are the most important thing, uh, with 747 landfills, only 219 coal power plants, we mathematically end up being cheaper to our customers, which means putting all these together by 2040, we believe that landfill coal ash will be the cheapest source of material for 75% of US customers. The key challenge, however, is that this is ash is impure. All ash is not equal. So while these landfills are utility owned and therefore the only thing in them is coal ash and coal waste, uh, because there are different types of coal waste, the sites themselves have impurities that need to be removed and require processing. And that is where we come in. So a bit about myself and Jorge. Uh, we're both at Stanford and recently finished. I finished with my MBA alongside my master's, previously at Tesla and McKinsey. I've been waiting to be a climate entrepreneur since I was the age of 13. So very excited and just genuinely, uh, genuinely just happy to be here. Jorge conversely has spent over the last decade focused on cement. Uh, he's done his um, master's in cement, undergrad in cement, PhD in cement and postdoc in cement. And so the two of us have been working towards decarbonizing this industry uh, with a lot of support, um, most notably from the Domcat Center. Uh, we would not be here without the Domcat Center. It's a huge plug for Brian Danica and the rest of the team. Uh, we are grateful for your support and of course, Matt as well. We have a three-step process to convert landfill to ash to gash. The first is we have proprietary data on the best sites. We've already mapped the 64 best landfills to go after and the 1,753 customers we want to target first. Uh, we shared some of our insights at the World of Coal Ash Conference, the thousand person event uh, of a couple of months ago, and we actually won the best presentation award there. Second, uh, we've created technology to clean these sites. So uh, we've used effectively off the shelf equipment that we've been able to modify to separate out the impurities in a way that no one else has done so before, at least not economically. And the keys here are that the entire process is self-contained. So unlike a lot of processes that require initial slew of chemicals, uh, we actually use the properties off the ash itself and the, chem and the chemicals off within the ash to clean these sites. And third is we generate gash. So we sell multiple end products through this process. We sell the ash and concrete as a primary revenue stream. In addition, we extract reddit elements, titanium, aluminum, and iron. Coming back to one of Suncorp's comments, uh, we harvest some of the metal contained within these sites 
as additional revenue streams. Cumulatively, we can generate up to $230 per ton of ash, which is about 55 to 60% more than the going rate for ash today, which boosts our EBITDA margins up to 80%. The takeaway being, we know more about ash than anyone. We can take the ash that no one else can use, and we can create value that no one else can generate. Where we are today is we have an actual product that works right now. So we've taken mixed ash from these landfill sites and processed it into ASTM grade ash that can be used in concrete. This was made possible through non-dilutive funding we've been awarded alongside five coal power plant partnerships that we have. And so we have about 120 pounds of ash sitting in our lab right now that we've been working through. Uh, we also recently cleared closed our uh, pre-seed fundraising round. So that's been uh, an exciting step that now helps us accelerate our progress even further. And so with that, happy happy to take any questions uh, and uh, we'll um, turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Krish. Uh, really impressive uh, progress in the, last, uh, in the last six months or so. Um, so uh, yeah, I have, uh, I, I have a lot of technical questions, which I guess I will spare our our general audience uh, coming from my my chemist perspective. But maybe you could um, just speak a little bit more about the processing. Do you envision trying to co-locate your purification um, equipment at the landfill site or having a dedicated site? No, it should be co-located with a landfill site. That's the most economic way of doing it, considering that logistics are the biggest cost. If you have to move everything to a central facility, it gets very expensive. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just thinking in terms of the overall, you know, carbon balance. Um, you know, trucking, uh, trucking solids around can very quickly uh, eat away at the at the LCA. Um, and can you comment on uh, sort of the the utility demand or energy demand um, with respect to the to the processing? And you mentioned it's a sort of off the shelf equipment, and you don't need a chemical input. Um, is there a you know significant energy demand for that? Or? Yeah, so one of the ways we've been able to reduce cost and energy demand is by using the unburned coal that's contained within the ash itself as a fuel source. And so ash typically contains up to five to eight percent of carbon that's left over from the coal generation itself. I see. And so by using that inbuilt energy, we actually bring down our uh, energy consumption. Okay. Uh, from an emission standpoint, our overall process emits about 15% that of what cement would produce. So while it is energy intensive, it's still significantly less energy intensive than cement itself. I see. Um, and the, um, so, so you mentioned that there's basically the, the waste that is the, the, the non-coal ash waste that is mixed in is just from the, from the coal plant itself. Is that, um, do you have a good sense of um, that, how those characteristics uh, vary from site to site, or, or I guess you down selected to what 64 sites for the sort of initial targeted deployment. Is that based on the impurity profile of the ash there, or is it based on other, other considerations? Oh, uh, that's right. So ash is variable. That's one of the key challenges that we have to work with. Uh, the down selection and effort that we did and why was so important to get the data up front. Uh, was because we had to find the most profitable sites to harvest, which is broadly based on three criteria. So one was definitely the chemistry of the ash. So that's something that we've characterized looking at the historic equipment on each of these sites, as well as the type of coal burned. The second was proximity to demand. So ensuring that we were nearby folks that we could actually sell to. And then the third was ensuring that the nearby demand didn't have adequate substitutes. So for example, active coal power plants that might already be burning would naturally be a much cheaper source of this material just because it's uh, it doesn't require any additional processing. And so only by layering on these three criteria will we be able to isolate the most profitable sites. Okay. And can you comment on from sort of a regulatory or, or, or permitting point of view, are, are there hurdles to sort of setting up a, a new process on a dedicated waste site or can you leverage the permits, you know, all that the, the coal plant already has? 
Yeah, so this comes back to the initial question. Uh, we absolutely do intend to co-locate near landfills. Uh, one of the key benefits being logistics, as we discussed. Uh, a secondary benefit being partnerships with utilities. So from our conversations with utility providers, uh, they are highly incentivized uh, to work with us, not only because we're providing uh, a service for them with regards to cleaning these sites, which is a major liability they're dealing with, but also uh, by partnering with us, uh, to backtrack, a lot of utilities in the US charge customers based on rate base. And so they look at their total assets and they charge, let's say, 7% on top of it. Uh, through our conversations and in our partnerships with the utilities we are currently working with, they've indicated interest in covering the capex associated with our facilities. Uh, what this would mean for them is an increase in assets that they can then charge customers to. What it means for us is one, not having to pay cap, not having to pay as high a capex amount upfront, and then two, leveraging the utility permits themselves, such that we don't have to go through the process of securing water permits, air permits, and so on, because we'd be building on coal plant land. I see. Um, and then uh, can you comment a little bit more about the the recovery of the critical minerals or, or rare earth elements? Is that um, sort of universal to to coal ash or in the sense that you, you can always expect to find uh, a certain amount of these you know relatively valuable impurities? Or is that something that also has to be sort of targeted? And then the related question is that that comes out in a separate processing step or the natural consequence of the of the isolation of the sort of purified so ash? so there are things that have to be toggled for example the rare earths but things like alumina make up about 15 to 25 percent of coal yeah. fly ash yeah. so it's pretty abundant and you know it's pretty well understood uh it is it is a natural course of the process and it sort of closes the loop on minimizing the solid effluent that we produce. So what 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 would be like you have uh what would be like you have a process that leaves 10% solid effluent, right? More waste that would go back into the landfill. That's what we take and use for critical mineral recovery. And that reduces the solid effluent that would potentially go back into a landfill. So it's just kind of like a natural cost. Our waste, our waste beneficiates itself. Yeah. You know, it turns out that the waste products that we produce form a unique combination that can be used to extract minerals. Awesome. Um, and then the uh, last question, unfortunately, we're, we're just about out of time, but uh, have you thought about any, are there other uses for coal ash beyond cement that you could potentially tap into given that you have this, you know, sort of ultra low or potentially negative feedstock cost? Uh, yes, there are a few uh, effectively lower value uses for coal ash. So think filling in foundations, using as an aggregate, uh, carbon capture actually is an interesting one that a lot of folks are looking at right now because ash contains a high amount of calcium that can be used to sequester carbon. Uh, so there are other use cases. Uh, what we found is the highest value uses for now are still cement and the metals, if we can extract them. That's why we're focused on those two spaces. Uh, but, you know, more than a low cement provider, we view ourselves as an ash refiner. And so we're always on the search for higher value applications. Got it. Thank you. Um, well, Chris, uh, Christian, Jorge, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing this this vision and and your progress with us today. I want to um, thank all of our uh, presenters. Uh, I I hope you'll agree that um, the the breadth of innovation um, at at Stanford, represented by um, the teams that we're we're fortunate to support here at the at the Tomcat Center, is. Uh, is truly remarkable, and uh, we're we're really um, thankful for the opportunity to to hear about some of it this afternoon. So thank you all, and uh, I hope you have some uh, fruitful uh, follow on uh, conversations with our uh, attendees today. Thanks everyone for joining us again.